To say Apple's laptops would be controversial over the past four years would be an understatement. From the expensive prices, inconsistent keyboards, thermal issues, and new ideas like the touch bar, it's fair to say that not everyone is a fan. However, this year, Apple might have just fixed one of my biggest pet peeves with their laptop lineup, and that is the entry-level MacBook Pro. The MacBook Pro retails for as low as $1,299. It comes equipped with a 1.4 gigahertz quad-core Intel Core i5 processor with turbo boost up to 3.9 gigahertz. The model I'm using is the base configuration, except I bumped the 128 gigabytes of storage up to a 256 gigabyte drive. So the entry-level 2019 MacBook Pro has almost the same design as its predecessor. It's 0.59 inches thick, and the weight is just about three pounds, so it's really easy to take with you and stick in a bag. The 13-inch MacBook Pro really is a nice middle ground between the bigger and heavier 15-inch laptop and the smaller and lighter MacBook Air. It's almost the Goldilocks of laptops. It's a perfect size. And it still has a nice design and a really nice build quality all these years later. On the side of the device, you'll find two Thunderbolt 3 ports. So not only can you use these ports to connect USB-C accessories, but these are also really powerful ports. So if you wanted to drive something like an external GPU, a 4K or 5K display, these ports are powerful enough to do that with one single cord connection. Unlike the more expensive $1,799 MacBook Pro, this MacBook Pro does only come with two of those ports. So if you go to the other side of the laptop, you'll only be greeted with a headphone jack. This does mean you lose out on some conveniences. For example, you can't charge on either side of the laptop. That's one of my favorite features with the new MacBook Pros. On this one, you're limited to just charging it on the left side. You might also find the two ports somewhat limiting. For example, if you're charging your laptop and you have something connected to the other port, you really don't have any other connections and that can be a major downside. Albeit, if you do need more ports, it's not a completely lost cause. You can simply buy an adapter that has a bunch of USB-A, USB-C, SD card slot ports for not that much money. You just have to remember to carry it around with you. The 2019 entry-level MacBook Pro also comes equipped with Apple's brand new butterfly keyboard, We've talked about this extensively, but I'll repeat myself one more time. So all the butterfly keyboards have had some issues in the past. With the third generation keyboard, Apple implemented a system to make the keys quieter, but a lot of people speculated that this system was actually to prevent debris from entering the keyboard. Apparently that didn't completely fix the issue, so Apple redid the butterfly keyboard again, putting two new material changes into that keyboard. That MacBook Pro revision has only been on the market for a couple of months, and these new keyboards have that new butterfly keyboard system. Now, even though Apple says this should fix the stuck or repeating key issue that some MacBook Pro users were facing, I personally have never had an issue with any of my laptops, so I really can't speak if this issue is 100% going to fix it. And because those laptops haven't been on the market for that long, it's honestly way too early to tell if these issues have been fully resolved. Now, with that being said, if you are worried about picking up this laptop and you're worried about your keyboard being broken and you having to pay a very expensive repair fee, you can rest somewhat assured that Apple is including every single laptop in their keyboard repair program. So even these new keyboards, if they break within a four year period, you can take them to Apple and they will replace them completely free of charge. And sorry if you've been watching all my videos, I've been mentioning this a lot, but I just wanna make sure that everyone is aware of these issues. As for the feel of the keys themselves, if you have any experience with the third generation butterfly keyboard, I feel that they feel pretty much the same. The keys still have low travel, but they are a lot quieter and softer than the first or second generation butterfly keyboard. I personally like the typing experience on the butterfly keyboards. I feel that the old keyboards are way too mushy whenever I go back to them. However, I know that it's not the case for everyone. A lot of people like a lot more travel in their keyboard. So if you do like more travel in your keyboard, you're probably going to be disappointed by the fourth generation as well. The biggest change to the entry-level MacBook Pro this year is that it no longer has the function key row. Apple has opted to put the touch bar on every MacBook Pro model. Now this could be a positive or a negative depending on your opinion of the touch bar. Some people see it as a gimmick, some people are lukewarm on it, they like some of the features, and some people do make actual use of it. My favorite feature of the touch bar is when I'm using something like a photo editing program, I can easily resize brushes 
on the touch bar without taking my hands off to do a keyboard shortcut and I can still click around with my mouse or trackpad while I'm resizing that brush. I feel like it saves me a lot of time and I like the way it feels. Now I think where people are going to like the touch bar being added to this model the most is now that this entry level MacBook Pro also includes Touch ID. And Touch ID just makes unlocking your computer or inputting passwords for other applications just so easy. It's a very nice convenience. Another benefit of the touch bar on the 2019 MacBook Pro is that it also includes Apple's T2 security chip. The T2 chip not only makes your Mac MacBook Pro more secure, but it also has some added benefits. It also controls things like the SSD speeds, and it also can do some things with video encoding. Jonathan Morrison actually made a video on this topic. I'll leave it in the link in the description below, but I'll have him explain those benefits to using the T2 chip to encode your video. The display of the MacBook Pro is a 13.3 inch retina display with 2560 by 1600 resolution at 227 pixels per inch. This MacBook Pro display also supports the P3 wide color spectrum, and this year's model also includes a true tone display on the entry level model. The display can also get up to 500 nits of brightness. Personally, I am a big fan of Apple displays. I think they have some of the best LCD displays in the industry, and this MacBook Pro is no exception. The MacBook Pro also comes equipped with some pretty impressive speakers, and I think they have a nice, loud, and well-balanced sound. Okay, so so far we talked about some changes with the entry-level MacBook Pro in terms of its design, but on the outside, it's pretty much exactly the same as the 2017 model, where the real changes do come to this model is in the processor. At first glance, you might not expect tons of performance coming out of a processor with a 1.4 gigahertz base clock speed, but this MacBook Pro does not disappoint. Running a benchmark like Geekbench, you're getting a multi-core score of 16,866 and a single core score of 4,463. And the processing speed even compares favorably to the $1,799 version of this laptop. There really isn't a major difference here. I think a lot of this performance comes down to the high turbo boost capabilities inside of this machine. Most MacBook Pros can only turbo boost to the highest clock speeds for a short period of time, and they usually hover just above their base clock speeds in heavy workflows. Because this entry-level MacBook Pro has such a lower base clock speed, I'm theorizing that when it is using those processors, it's able to turbo boost up to those processor clock speeds that the other MacBook Pros and it can maintain those speeds. It doesn't have to drop below to that 1.4 gigahertz. I say I theorize because the normal tool I use to benchmark the processor clock speed, the Intel Power Gadget, wasn't working on this version of the laptop. Maybe it's too new, maybe the processor's too new, and I just couldn't get it to work. One other notable difference between the entry-level MacBook Pro and that more expensive $1,799 configuration is that this MacBook Pro has a lower SSD speed. Now these SSD speeds still aren't slow by any means, but those higher configurations of the MacBook Pro can get read and write speeds in the 2000 to 3000 area. Battery life is a mixed bag. Apple claims you'll get 10 hours of battery life on their website, but I found my usage to be closer to six to eight hours. Now that can really depend on what you're using your laptop for. So if you're using it for lighter tasks, obviously the battery life will last longer, but if you're using more intensive applications, that battery can degrade pretty quickly. So obviously day-to-day -day performance with this MacBook Pro is great. Obviously no slowdowns with simple tasks like web browsing, watching video, word processing, Excel files, anything you're doing like that, it's very simple, breezes right through it. For more intensive tasks like video editing or photo editing, this MacBook Pro performed really well. The timeline in Final Cut Pro 10 was really smooth and export times were speedy. Editing photos in a program like Affinity Photo was also really quick. Overall, I was really impressed with the big gains in CPU performance on this entry level model. At first, I thought the 1.4 gigahertz base clock speed was going to be really slow, but I was pleasantly surprised with the speed. And I feel like it is on par with those higher configurations of the 13 inch MacBook Pro. As for graphical performance, the entry level MacBook Pro comes equipped with Intel Iris Plus Graphics 645. Running the Unigen Heaven benchmark, we were able to get an FPS of 33 frames per second on medium with an overall score of 830. 
Opening up a game like StarCraft 2, I was able to play at medium settings with frame rates above 30 frames per second, usually hovering around 40 to 45 FPS. It is an integrated graphics card, so you shouldn't expect super high level performance. If you want really high level performance, you're going to have to go with the 15 inch MacBook Pro running some of the Vega graphics on there, but it is fine if you wanna play some games on medium to low settings. So when the original entry level MacBook Pro was introduced, it was introduced as a replacement for the MacBook Air. And even though it had the MacBook Pro name, it just wasn't up to par with what you should expect with Pro performance from an Apple laptop. And because of that, in the past, I've had some difficulties recommending the 13 inch MacBook Pro with touch bar because of its extremely high starting price at $1,799. As of today, I'm happy to say that is no longer the case. The new entry level MacBook Pro is a great package coming in at a respectable $1,299 starting price with a quad core processor, touch bar and touch ID sensor, a thin and light package, and hopefully a fixed keyboard I can recommend this MacBook Pro to almost anyone. But that's what I think about the entry-level MacBook Pro. Let me know what you think about the entry-level MacBook Pro in the comments below. If you wanna support the channel in any way, maybe purchase this configuration of the MacBook Pro, make sure you check out the links in the description. If you like the video, make sure you give me a like. If you wanna see more from my channel, make sure you're subscribed. And as always, I will see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.